Thank you for joining us today. I want to welcome everyone to this installment of the STS 2022 webinar series. This series features presentations and panel discussions on a variety of topics relevant and important to cardiothoracic surgeons. The topic for today is prolonged static lung storage, refrigerated or on ice. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the STS website and YouTube channel. We invite you to become a member of STS. You'll enjoy a variety of discounts, benefits, and opportunities to help you grow professionally. Learn more at sts.org membership. At this time, I'm pleased to welcome our moderator, Dr. Errol Bush. Dr. Bush, welcome. I will now turn it over to you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Errol Bush, and I'm the Surgical Director of Lung Transplantation at Johns Hopkins University. I'm excited to be your moderator today and for us to have the opportunity to participate in this webinar on prolonged static lung storage, refrigerated or on ice. On behalf of the panelists and myself, I'd first like to thank the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and the chairs of the Workforces on General Thoracic Surgery and on end-stage cardiopulmonary disease for supporting this endeavor appreciating the importance of this topic, as well as recognizing the excitement that the topic has brought to our lung transplant community over the last one to two years, and the potential implications that prolonged hypothermic lung storage may have on the future of lung transplantation donor availability, outcomes, our professional development, lifestyle, and well-being. We have an exciting panel of international guests with you today, that I'd like for them to introduce themselves before we get started with the meat of our webinar. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jose Luis Campo Cañaveral from Hospital Universitario Puerta de Hierro, Majadahonda in Madrid. It's really nice to, to see you and to share these moments with you. Hello, I'm Marcelo Cipel, uh, lung transplant surgeon uh, from uh, University of Toronto, and very happy to be here and, and share some of our data and experience. Hi, my name is Conrad Hetzenegger. I'm the head of the Vienna Lung Transplant Program, Medical University of Vienna, uh, <clears throat> which is one of the largest European lung transplant centers, and I'm happy to be part of this panel discussion today. I'm Jocelyn Kukreja, Professor of Surgery at the uh, University of California, San Francisco. I'm the Director of Lung Transplant there. We perform about 80 transplants a year. And uh, we have recently also, based on Toronto's experience, started to experience some of the uh, prolonged hypothermic or higher hypothermic uh, uh, lung transplants. And I'm um, very happy to be part of this uh, panel. Hi, I'm uh, Eddie Suarez. I'm at Houston Methodist Hospital. I'm the director of heart and lung transplant as well as the chief of transplant over here. Uh, we do around, we've ranged anywhere from the 70 to 100 range for lung transplants for the last several years. And uh, we, and based on, uh, as uh, Chesley mentioned, everyone and others uh, new uh, data information started using more of the paragonic system and are looking into using the refrigerator systems to preserve our lungs and uh, time shift where we need to. Well, thank you very much um, to our expert panelists. I'd like to first start uh, with, uh, with Marcelo. If you um, would take a few moments just to tell us about how you and your colleagues at the University of Toronto and Toronto General Hospital have um, revolutionized um, our field with the proposal of using um, hypothermic storage, uh, specific, specifically uh, 10 degrees, um, to um, prolong donor storage as well as um, to affect change in your program. Good, uh, thanks, Earl. So I'm just going to show a few slides that show some of the important data over the last uh, year or so that will, will serve as a very good uh, uh, basis uh, for uh, our further uh, discussion here. I just want to share that uh, this conflicts of interest consultant for lung bioengineering, and I'm also founder and shareholder of Trofarox Technologies, which is company involved in some uh, organ preservation devices. Um, and some research support from these companies. Um, so I think we're all familiar here that, uh, you know, the gold standard technique of lung preservation since its inception has been uh, a, a cold static uh, preservation um, 
over the last 20 years at least with low potassium dextran solution and then inflation with oxygen um, and preserved in a cooler of ice, which ranges uh, somewhere between one and four degrees. And uh, by using this uh, technique, um, uh, most centers are quite conservative in the allowance of cold ischemic time. And this is a uh, UNOS data uh, showing uh, that the average ischemic times are, are about five hours um, uh, across the board. Now, um, when we look back uh, in the uh, initial literature in lung transplantation in the 80s um, and early 90s, there were already some indications, some studies done uh, here in Toronto and then uh, in St. Louis, uh, showing that um, uh, when we investigated different temperatures of preservation, actually 10 degrees was the most optimal uh, preservation at that time uh, for uh, cold uh, static. However, uh, this was not uh, taken up further uh, over the last uh, several uh, years. More recently, we started uh, re-evaluating this process uh, and uh, more importantly, we look at uh, some of the most important mechanisms why 10 degrees is better for lung preservation and protection. And uh, in this study, we preserved healthy pig lungs um, at 10 degrees in a, in a refrigerator or at four degrees in a cooler of ice. Um, and um, after 36 hours preservation, we uh, evaluated these organs on normothermic EVLP. And what we shown here was a remarkable difference in the release of cell-free DNA, uh, having a lot more injury in the four degree group. Um, this was also uh, translated to a higher inflammasome activation and IL-1 beta release um, and also IL-1-8. And uh, we also showed that uh, the sodium potassium atipase uh, did not work well at, at, uh, in the ice cooler preservation, but it did work quite well uh, in the 10 degree uh, preservation. And uh, also when we look at uh, function of the lungs, they were remarkably different in terms of compliance, airway pressure, acquisition of edema, and again, uh, uh, cell-free uh, DNA. Now, um, those lungs were normal lungs that were preserved for 36 hours. And uh, we wondering whether if you have an already injured lung, which is most of our donor lungs, they actually have some uh, injuries, uh, inflammation and, and so on, would the 10 degree benefit uh, be maintained? And so we did this aspiration induced model. This paper was just published this month from Journal Heart and Lung. Um, and uh, we, uh, after inducing aspiration injury with a PF ratio below 300 in the donors, we took the lungs out and then either transplanted directly with minimal ischemia or we kept at four degrees for 12 hours or at 10 degrees for 12 hours. And again, did the left single lung transplantation. And remarkably, we saw the same message as we saw in the normal lungs. As you can see here, the red line had a much better PF ratio after transplantation. But what was even more surprising to us in, in these studies was that uh, keeping the lungs for 12 hours at 10 degrees actually led to better functions compared to lungs that had minimal cold ischemia, which suggested perhaps uh, there are some uh, reparative mechanisms happening at that uh, temperature with some low metabolism rate uh, ongoing. Um, you can also see besides the, the function, the histology of those lungs were remarkable different uh, uh, in these uh, two groups and, and also compared to minimal cold ischemia. So this is a, a kind of a change in, in, in paradigm that we always said that the longer the ischemic time is the worst, uh, but maybe that's really not the true. Um, can we use this technique with EVLP? Yes, we can. Um, as you know, EVLP um, is mostly used to assess uh, high risk donor lungs. But in this study, we combine the technique of 10 degree cold static preservation with EVLP. And by doing that combination, we're able to get to three days of lung preservation uh, with successful uh, post-transplant outcomes in a large animal. 
Now, um, we then uh, moved on to this uh, clinical trial, extending code uh, static preservation. So this was intentional extension of uh, code preservation times to avoid overnight transplant. And there is some data, uh, this is a recent paper from St. Louis, retrospective study showing that transplants done during the day have better outcomes than transplants done during the night. Again, you know, I, I think this is data that needs to be confirmed with, with a larger data set and, and other variables. But nevertheless, uh, there is some indication in kidney transplant that that's the case too. So the hypothesis of this trial was whether intentional prolongation at 10 degrees was safe. Uh, this is the study design that we did. Any cross clamp after 6 p.m., uh, basically uh, that uh, lungs that didn't need EVLP uh, was then um, uh, transferred to our uh, center in a regular cooler of ice and then put in the 10 degree refrigerator. And uh, the transplant procedure could not start before 6 a.m. Uh, as per study protocol. And so we enrolled 70 patients, uh, 18 months. Uh, this uh, included our uh, uh, university and uh, Vienna and Puerto de Viejo in Madrid. Um, and we compare the outcomes of these uh, uh, patients with regular transplantations uh, in a matched uh, based design. Uh, you can see here that in the study cohort, uh, we had about 23% of these CDs, similar age as the matched controls. Uh, good PF ratios as expected, these lungs were accepted for transplant um, and a slightly higher smoking history in the study cohort. And uh, this is again how the study logistics was. So the transport to the recipient hospital at four degrees. So the average was about three hours in a cooler of ice, uh, but we went as far as five hours and 40 minutes. Um, and then the intentional prolongation is the yellow bar here that showed was a, a close to eight hours of intentional prolongation of preservation time, which ranged from one hour and a half to 14 hours. And uh, when you look at the study group here, preservation times, they ranged again from for the second line between eight hours and 51 minutes to 19 hours and 41 minutes of preservation time. This is only cold preservation time, does not include any EVLP cases. Um, and uh, the outcomes uh, are described here, and we had a very low incidence of PGD3 at 72 hours, um, certainly not worse than controls. And I could argue that if we had a larger sample size, maybe we would even show benefit in decreasing rates of, of PGD by using this design. And uh, ICU stay and uh, post-transplant survival was very similar. And this is the survival curves here, the 70 patients. So. Just to finish here, um, I would say that 10 degree cold static preservation allows for safe extension of preservation and avoidance of overnight transplant or other logistics that we're going to talk here. And it could become the new standard of cold static preservation and uh, a multi-center trial comparing the two strategies, um, it's uh, upcoming. So thank you very much and um, I'll uh, stop sharing. Yeah, thanks, Marcelo, for sharing that. It's very uh, fascinating and exciting uh, for the community. As you mentioned, there are two other centers um, that were involved with you. I'd like to get the perspective of Conrad and Jose from those centers. Why don't we start with Conrad? Why don't you tell us about your program and then how um, how easy was it to convince um, your colleagues to, uh, to use this alternative uh, storage temperature and how are you using it now? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Marcelo, for this uh, uh, introduction. Um, we did not in invent, of course, the 10 degree. Uh, th this came from the whole story, started in Toronto, but we were early adopters, and uh, then we agreed to participate in the, in the study Marcelo has just shown. Um, and uh, we had the advantage that there was a previous publication with uh, five preliminary uh, uh, cases that showed uh, with prolonged 10 degree storage, you actually have a good outcome. So these five cases were very convincing. So I think safety issues were not really, uh, um, you know, something of concern when we started to participate uh, in the study. Um, we have uh, meanwhile uh, done uh, uh, 34 uh, prolonged 10 degree cold ischemic lung transplantations. 
um, with a maximum preservation time of up to 19 hours uh, with uh, good results. So these 19 hours lungs, they work perfectly fine. Um, we currently don't know what, what is the clinical limit, but beyond avoiding um, overnight transplantations, we have, um, we have used prolonged 10 degree storage to actually avoid morning transplantations. And uh, I'd like to show you one case, if I may, Please. I'll just share my screen here. Hopefully I can manage. You see this? Yeah, I think it's displaying here. Yeah, so that's what we, we, we this is still within a study and uh, we have an ethics amendment to the 10 degree study Marcelo has just shown you uh, that we can actually prolong whole ischemic times to, to, to do our elective cases in the morning and then start the transplantation in the afternoon. And this is one of the, these typical cases. This is uh, where you see, you see the donor lung was pretty okay, 60 years in age, PF ratio of 387. So that's actually a very good lung. Uh, uh, the aortic cro cross clamp time was at 2 a.m. So 2, 2.41 in the morning. Um, and uh, we brought the organ back uh, to our hospital. I arrived at 7 a.m. in the morning, but we didn't start the transplant until 5 p.m. in the afternoon, did our elective uh, oncological cases, and then uh, brought the recipient in after we have finished the elective cases for the implantation. And the reperfusion of the right side was... Uh, 8 uh, p.m. and then reperfusion of left side was uh, one and a half hours later, um, making a total of uh, 18 hours, 53 minutes. And this was an IPF patient. And you can see his uh, x-ray upon arrival at the ICU was extubated and post-op day one, ICU stay six days, hospital stay 25 days. So that's an optimal outcome. And uh, um, with uh, these kind of experience, uh, we we are not worried at all uh, about outcomes any longer. And uh, we started to play around with the uh, prolonged cold ischemic times. And, um, uh, and I think this is a really exciting topic because this is, is a game changer. We, 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 we now think about lung transplantation being more kind of a semi-elective procedure. That's great. And uh, Jose, how about in uh, Spain? How, um, how have you adapted and um, being one of the early adopters um, to this uh, technology? Yeah. And, and specifically, maybe if you, especially if you have a slide to show us how you've reacted to any challenges that you may have faced in, um, in using mm -hmm. this technology. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to participate. And thank you, Marcelo, for the opportunity to take part of the trial. Um, actually, we consider ourselves early adopters because we, we saw the presentation in the, in the I remember, it, it, AETS 2021, I remember, and um, I just was texting Marcelo, just send me the protocol because we wanted to, you know, adopt this protocol. Um, <clears throat> we are a medium-sized lung transplant program in Spain. We do like 45 to 55 lung transplants per year. And um, as I said, it's a you know, medium size. Um, so for us, uh, an advantage like this, just to managing the logistics in the land transplantation is a huge advantage. And beyond the um, uh, avoiding overnight, um, <clears throat> sorry, land transplantation and uh, avoiding morning land transplantation just to, to keep the schedule cases, uh, we found another advantage because in our hospital, sometimes it's really difficult to gather two transplant teams to do two simultaneous uh, cases. Um, you have to set up two or mm, a set of uh, nurses and anesthesiologists, perfusionists, and uh, obviously surgeons. And um, we found that the 10 degrees offered us the opportunity to take these two uh, donors simultaneously and do two lung transplants without reject and one donor, one suitable donor for our recipient. I wanted to share one of the uh, two of our, our cases. I think it's, uh, is that one? So um, this was uh, a special situation for us. Uh, 
it happened a couple of times or three times uh, since we started the, the tender risk protocol and then we were offered two donors at more or less the same time. We had a really sick patient on ECMO for two months in the ICU. So we just don't want to say no to that uh, good donor for him. And then we had another donor, local donor uh, for a, a regular COPD patient. So we decided to uh, intentionally prolong the call ischemic time for the donor uh, that goes that went for the um, for the more complex case and do that complex case in the next morning. So uh, the first donor's uh, cross clamp was 4 p.m. and we do the transplant. We did the transplant right away um, after the retrieval. As you see in this graph, the blue one is uh, you know the end of the surgery was at uh, 1 a.m. and we started the. Um, we cross clamped the second donor at 9 p.m. and started the tender risk preservation at 11 p.m. And the award time for the second recipient for the complex one, he was a CF patient complicated with an RDS post COVID. And we started at 8 a.m. and we had these preservation times, total preservation times you can see here 13 and a half hours and almost 16 hours. So even though maybe for you it's not that uh, important because you, you, maybe you are you know, running very large lung transplant programs and you can do maybe two transplants simultaneously, for us it's a huge advantage because we can uh, just say yes to two donors at the same time. We had some other cases with uh, more prolonged uh, ischemic time. I remember, I think the maximum for us uh, has been 15 and 18 hours for the second graph. And, um, and yes, the, the outcomes are actually were very good for these two recipients that those are the first day post-op checks is raised. And another logistics that we have overcome with this tender wheeze is like um, sometimes you receive an offer and you have some uh, pathologic analysis to do on the donor or some, something like that. So you, we just retrieve the, the donor and go to tender wheeze and just wait for the result. And sometimes um, if you don't have the tender risk protocol, you have to say no, because the, pro the, um, the pathologist is gonna take uh, three hours or four hours to say that lesion is benign or, and you have to say no because of the call scanning time. But I don't think it is a problem uh, right now with this uh, uh, tender risk call storage. That's great. Uh, thank you for highlighting uh, some of the logistical concerns. Yeah, stop sharing. Um, Jasleen, um, so at UCSF, um, I'd like for you to highlight potentially some logistical um, challenges you may have had. Uh, obviously, um, half of your 250 nautical mile circle is water, so you may have to travel far, Hawaii, Alaska. Um, have you utilized um, alternative um, temperature or non-ice storage methods? And tell us about your experience. Um, thanks, Errol. Uh, so we've, we've been going to Hawaii for some time. Um, it was started by my predecessor and we've continued it. I think we've done about 11 or 12 lungs. So not, not a lot over, over a decade. So average one transplant per year, you can almost say. Uh, unlike the, uh, the, the 10 degree storage, we have done these on, you know, regular four degree storage. And our last run was done on paragonics closer to five to six degrees. Uh, and what is interesting about our, our um, prolonged ischemia time is that we don't take chartered flights. Uh, we actually take commercial flights. So we have to time the operation in such a way. I should have put a picture up of, uh, the organ sitting in first class um, uh, on a 737. Uh, but in any event, so we've been very selective in these donors, unlike the, the 10 degree protocol where, you know, you take all comers, you don't um, really pick and choose. For, for these uh, four degree to six degree centigrade lungs, uh, we are very super selective. And our ischemia time has reached about 13 hours max. Um, I must say, I don't have histological slides. We've had excellent outcomes in them uh, with the exception of one case. Uh, but I think that one case, um, we had death within 45 days post-transplant. He was a very complex patient. Uh, so overall, I would say pretty, pretty good experience with this. But again, like I said, very super selective. 
Um, now, you know, I, I, I don't know if I can ask a question right now. Yeah, please. So, please. so Conrad, you mentioned that you know doing cases in the evening uh, after finishing your elective case, which is great. Um, but also leads to fatigue and burnout, et cetera, right? So so my question is for, for all the folks who have done it, you know, Jose, Conrad, and Marcelo, how do you convince your hospital to be able to get a first time, uh, you know, like a first start case when you have elective cases scheduled for the day? Because that's one of the biggest problems we have of real estate in the OR, you know, um, with elective cases scheduled. Yeah, um, maybe I can start. I think the the way hospitals work work is different around the world. So in Europe, I mean, we can do lung transplantation, but we have to stop one of our regular thoracic OR rooms uh, for this purpose, uh, which is not as a big issue as in North America because our patients are readmitted at the ward, so they just wait wait uh, one additional day for the for the surgery. Uh, it's just uh, creating a, a queue afterwards. So we would rather uh, do our elective cases and do the transplantation in the afternoon. And uh, I don't. I mean, if you have a different OR team, which is the case most of the time, uh, doesn't matter. There's you know you can. It's uh, as long as you avoid doing like your anastomosis at 3 a.m. in the morning. I think doing it at 6 p.m. in the afternoon or early evening, it's still fine. So I don't think fatigue is an issue. Um, the technique has actually or can help us to kind of, um, um, how do you say, um, optimizing the resources you have in the, in the specific surrounding you work at. And the answer is uh, different to every hospital, every country, wherever you work. I don't think there is a, unif a, a uniform answer to that question. Yeah, if I can just uh, comment on that too, I, I agree with Conrad. I mean, what we used to do was to do the transplant all night and then do the elective cases in the morning. And I, and I think that's much worse than you know, doing a couple of lobectomies and, and then start a transplant at 3.30 and you, you're done at, at 11 or so uh, for a double lung. Um, and, but I, I think also at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the hospitals will have to, to readjust uh, to create more capacity during the day uh, rather than, you know, doing this at night. And I think the transplant teams also have to create you know, more capacity in a sense that, you know, you have the transplants all booked for 8 a.m. And, um, you know, you, you may have elective case on that day and then you go and do your elective case and some some of your colleagues will do the, the transplant and, and vice versa. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's a new restructuring that, that will have to, to do it. And from my end, um... You, you know, we, we started to adopt the protocol that start the lung transplant induction, the, um, the induction for the recipient at 6 a.m. So the surgery itself starts 7, 7.30 a.m. And we can, you know, push the oncological cases uh, after the transplant. And we managed to do uh, some of the cases, uh, the lung transplant cases until 12 to to 1 p.m. and then start the oncological case. We usually do one uh, one surgical, one uh, oncology case, so it's not really difficult for us to to push that case uh, after the transplant. And as Conrad said, in, here in Spain, in Spain is the same. You can you know really uh, adjust the schedule and operate on the patient uh, the day after. I agree. Let's um, um, with Jasmine that um, this, I think the phrase people are using is time shifting, um, that it does seem like it would be difficult here at our institution as well as others where um, where there's quite a busy elective schedule during the day. I so was wondering um, from our uh, colleagues, um, Eddie and uh, Dr. Michael Smith, who's also uh, joined us, if they could comment um, as well, how is um, how are your thoughts on 
uh, time shifting and then um, alternative storage temperatures and how you're utilizing it in your programs. Well, I want to thank you guys for doing the research myself and everyone else because you've definitely transformed our life. You know, uh, it's something we all kind of all suspected, but you've actually gone and proved that the lungs, they're not very metabolically active. You can store them a lot longer than you think you can and, and have great outcomes. Uh, for us, for any, everyone, like you said, organizing uh, organizing your resources for the optimal time for our sick patients is important. And the uh, and the paper from St. Louis, like you mentioned, showing the middle of the night cases don't do as well. You do have less resources. You have to do less personnel. You have less um, less options in, in treating people in, in critical situations. So. Um, it, it is something that I, I think will help outcomes. For us, we right now we have been using the periodontic system, which uh, after the research that you did, I think it, it's been a good uh, good mechanism for us to hold our organs in, at a at, known at a constant temperature, not the ten degrees that that, uh, that seems to be optimal, but holding it at a constant temperature uh, for hours. And we, we've we've shifted and had ischemic times of twelve hours with no complications. Same thing post op day one extubated and, and a routine recovery. Uh, so it is something that seems to be a good option for us and that it's something that's that's mobile, easily accessible to us. Expensive is expense is a different uh, discussion, but it is it allows a lot of uh, utility for us to shift around our, our resources, our times, our OR schedules. Um, we're lucky, Jesley, and I'm sorry you have that issue, but we have a commitment from our hospital that whenever a transplant happens that we'll have a team so we we're fortunate in that we can direct it to optimize it for i mean our our or teams as well as for our patients and and all the other resources we need. Uh, so it, it's it's been a it's a great life i mean game changer for for all of us i should mention that um uh, eddie like you we are also using the paragonics and we actually also started doing the more warmer temperature at eight degrees uh, since I think in July or something like that. And uh, the next step <laughs> for us is also to take it to longer times and do more scheduled operations as opposed to, you know, whenever the organs arrive. And, and we've been using it for all different organs too. So we've been doing like six to eight degrees, but so we, we haven't been needing the super pristine ones, just any organ we think is worth transplantation, I think is fine for this system. I know Dr. Smith is from from Arizona, where they have a large experience as well, I, I assume. Nice to, nice to meet you, actually. Hi, how are you? Yeah, thank you uh, for the invitation to participate in the panel. I apologize for my late arrival. But uh, I, I, I guess the comments that I would make in terms of our experience, um, I'm at St. Joseph's Hospital in Phoenix. We have a fairly busy lung transplant program. And we have uh, primarily been a uh, preservation on ice program. Um, with the obvious limitations of that, and then have the opportunity to participate in the portable L EVLP uh, trials over the last uh, few years. And with regard to um, uh, using that technology for uh, either distant donors or time logistics, as we're talking about here, that's that's when we've sort of employed that technology. Um, is, for example, we may have uh, simultaneous transplants that are uh, taking place at one time or, uh, you know, quickly to follow each other, uh, where we may not have resources to do them simultaneously, or you may have a cabbage transplant or some other major procedure going on that will uh, prolong the preservation period. And, and so we primarily use portable EVLP for that, as well as distance, and we've gone to Hawaii as well as the East Coast. Um, I think our longest preservation on portable EBLP has been just over 24 hours with a successful outcome. Um, it, I look forward to seeing more data regarding the 10 degrees uh, Celsius storage. It's very eye-opening, um, you know, what the Toronto team has been able to accomplish uh, with, with that sort of paradigm shift, if you will, in terms of being able to uh, do these cases in a more of an elective manner and um, not feel so much under the gun when you have these sort of time logistics uh, issues. And so, you know, I look forward to, to seeing more on this. And I, I think we would definitely be interested in, in moving forward with um, uh, trying that paradigm out as, as well. Um, but yeah, so um, if, if you have any questions for me, but we, we, we would, would welcome the idea of pursuing it. But haven't had any experience with it yet and look forward to hearing more 
Thanks for sharing. I think um, so. There's a question in the chat, and I'll paraphrase it and direct it first towards Marcelo, but get everyone. This is a question paraphrased from uh, Dr. Osho from uh, Boston. Um, so uh, you showed the data initially in your slides, Marcelo, um, comparing, I think, a range of zero degrees to 38 degrees, um, 10 degrees being the best. Um, and so the question is, is there a temperature per perhaps between four to 10 degrees that also might be optimal? So it's sort of the devices our panelists are mentioning, these advanced uh, storage devices usually maintain between four to eight degrees, seemingly also with good outcomes. Do you think there's a difference uh, between sort of eight degrees and 10 degrees um, that, um, that might make a clinical uh, difference? Yeah, I, you know, it's a good question. I, I don't think anyone has investigated the, those temperatures in between. Um, I mean, there's strong data now that, that 10 degree now and in the past, you know, uh, in those initial studies that 10 degree did protect sodium potassium pump function. And now we showed mitochondrial preservation and, and so on. Whether those uh, pump functions will continue at the same level at seven or six degrees. I, I don't think there has been a systematic uh, study to, um, you know, experimental study to, uh, to compare that. Um, and again, this is, um, this is uh, maybe just a limitation uh, for the current devices, but I, I don't, you know, it, it's, it's something that can be easily uh, overcome with, with current technology as well. Certainly, I think uh, we all come from various institutions with different uh, financial structures, but I think all of our systems are trying to preserve costs. Um, a refrigerator seems pretty cheap and easy um, compared to some of the, uh, the storage devices, especially the portable ones. How do we sort of balance these opportunities and what, um, what I guess, what's been your strategy at locally in order to try to contain costs and if there'll be a, um, a strategy in the future that might welcome a portable 10 degree uh, Celsius uh, device. Yeah, so I mean, currently our, our, our cost uh, is, is basically zero uh, because we transport in a cooler of ice. Um, and again, we go all the way to, you know, to Vancouver or, or California and we transport the lines, uh, you know, uh, Six six hours on on the plane, um, and then when you get here, if the lung needs EVLP, go to EVLP. If the lungs just need prolonged preservation, uh, we'll we'll keep it. But most most cases is about I would say as we showed in the study, three to four hours um, of ice cooler, and then uh, on the on the ten degree refrigerator, which just is a, a stand standing uh, fridge in the OR that has a perfect uh, temperature uh, control. Um, now, would putting, putting the lungs straight on 10 degree be beneficial? Um, I think possibly yes, given all the benefits of 10 degree, uh, but that's still something uh, that uh, you know, needs to, to be demonstrated and we need to have a, a device able to do that, uh, to be able to implement on the clinical, on the clinical side. How will anyone else um... Um, thoughts about uh, cost containment, Conrad? Yeah. No, no. I, I just wanted to, to follow on that when we talk about storage on ice, very often it's not four degrees because it's uh, depending on how long you, 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 your transportation time is. Um, you know, we all have seen lungs with uh, frozen uh, fat, fatty tissue. So the temperature at some parts is much uh, lower than four degrees. It's between one, two, maybe at some parts zero degrees. And uh, that's, that's uh, it's harmful for the organ, I guess. So we, we thought in initially that the safety margin of 10 degrees is probably not good enough. And if the lungs warm up, it's, uh, it's uh, dangerous. But being too cool is probably as, as, as dangerous as being too warm. Hmm. Do we know how much the lung warms up? Um, so if you're starting on ice and, um, and then you put it in the refrigerator um, at 10 degrees, um, is it still, is it actually at 10 degrees if you transplant the lung six or eight hours later, or is it still warming up from cold, colder? Uh, we don't know. 
and then it's always the question where you measure, whether you measure on the surface or in, in the lung, in the tissue, you will probably never find out. There is also a difference, sorry, just to, to follow on this one, there's a, it's a difference if you if you put, you know, both lungs or block into the uh, 10 degree device, and then remove them and then uh, split them at the back table. Um, or you just bring out the lungs, you know, for the front, for the first side out of the fridge, the 10 degree fridge, and then the second side out of the 10 degree fridge and split them before putting them in inside the fridge. Um, and there is uh, different kind of practices here as well. Um, there, yeah, we, there is a lot of unanswered questions here, right? Yeah. Just from a practical standpoint, we, we don't split the lungs before. I know Conrad does that. We don't split the lungs before putting in the 10 degree. We keep as a block. And basically, when the recipient is ready, you know, when we, you know, kind of get the first lung out in the recipient, we take the lungs out of the of the 10 degree and then split in the back table and just leave the other lung waiting as, as usual. Um, so you don't put back in the 10 degree? We, we don't put lung? back. No, we don't put back. I mean, that would be about, you know, probably about two hours that that lung will sit in the back table. I, you know, I, I do think sitting in the back table, it's not very cold as well. I mean, we never measure, but I'm pretty sure is it's it's not going to be in the one to two degree range. Um, and um, it's, I think will be more close, you know, between four and 10 uh, when, when it's sitting there. And it's usually, a short time too, so. Yeah, in our okay. case, we usually split the lungs in the, um, in the donor site. And then we travel with them split it, of course. And then we put the two lungs uh, independently in the refrigerator. Just take one when the recipient is ready and take the other one afterwards. Just we just keep the second line in 10 degrees for for extending that uh, 10 degrees preservation. Yes. I had two questions for you guys. So one thing I learned with the paragonic system is that um, what we've been doing for our lungs just on the cooler, we we put the lungs in the first bag with the, the cold preservation solution. The second bag has like ice slush. It's 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 not like ice ice cubes, but it's like water with a little bit of ice in it to keep everything cold. And then the third non-sterile bag. With the paragonic system, we know you put the ice and preservation solution. The next one is just ice cold saline, no ice whatsoever, which seems to... I think, like you're saying, being too cold, maybe, uh, yeah, as as Connor was saying, being too cold, maybe electrics as well. So, so having something where it's not ice, there's no ice outside of that, may be helpful than than the third one. Uh, do you is that what you guys usually do? Is it, yeah, I see you shaking your heads. Do you guys usually just use ice cold saline in your second bag, or ice slush for your standard preservations? In terms of, um, it sounds like your standard preservation systems or ice preservation may be different from ours. So I was wondering how you guys did that. No, we, we never put in ice in one of our bags. It's just preservation solution and cold saline. Yeah. And that's it. And then the second question, and since that's universal, that's what we started changing. So, I mean, it's something that's kind of a carryover from, you know, a couple of decades of, of how, how it used to be done. Uh, second question, where do you actually logistically put the refrigerator in your operating room? Is it in an OR? Is it some other storage system? Where, do you, where have you guys put it? So we have we find uh, like a room before uh, entering the OR, and uh, we have the there several supplies for the regular surgeries and uh, and then, then we found a spot for the refrigerator and then that's it is just outside the the operating room, but inside the, you know the main room for for thoracic surgery, so it's all the time is controlled by our nurses that they, they are you know. Uh, overnight in the hospital and uh, all of us is I mean it's a, a in plain sight you can see it but it's not in the operating room it's just outside in, in our in our case uh, we have uh, an organ repair uh, laboratory inside the uh, OR so it's a, it's two dedicated rooms for organ ex vivo perfusion so that the the 10 degree fridge inside that room uh, so basically, the fellow arrives with the lung, they put the lung there. Um, if there is EVLP, then the lung will come out of the 10 degree fridge, go to EVLP, finish EVLP, goes back to the 10 degree fridge. Um, or if there is no EVLP, just stay there until um, 
until the recipient is ready. So I, I have a question um, for the panel. Um, you know, historically, we always worry about that warm ischemic period between taking the lungs out of ice and putting them in the chest and sewing them in. And I know in training, we used to put ice on top of the lungs to sort of ameliorate that. And we were always taught to sew them in as fast as you can because you wanted to limit that warm ischemic time. But I sometimes wonder if it's not necessarily the absolute temperature, but the rate of change of the temperature. And I just wondered if anyone had any thoughts about that and what their practices were around that, because it would seem to me that an abrupt change of going from, let's say, four degrees, because you put ice on the lungs as you are sewing them in and you suddenly reperfuse them and they go to 37 degrees, that seems just as perhaps traumatic as, you know, maybe the long, warm ischemic time itself. And I just wonder what others have, have thoughts around that for. Yeah, um, I mean, we we use a uh, called a cooling jacket, you know, in the chest and you know during the implantation, um, um, we don't use ice. And um, you know, I think the lung does warm up, uh, you know, during the implantation time. Um, and um, you know, I I think I'm I'm not sure if um, you know. First of all, I think starting at ten degrees, I don't think alters too much uh, that. Uh, you know, temporal warming of, of, of the organ at, at that time. Uh, but it hasn't been, uh, I ha we haven't seen that as an issue with this new protocol, um, at least, so. So Michael, I think um, you're right. You know, I used to think that the warm ischemic time would have an influence, but I must say it has not panned out. And second thing I would say is that, you know, I've practically, for the last several years, I don't know how long now, Errol remembers probably better, um, we switched to ECMO intraop, right? And uh, for practically all our cases, so we have uh, control reperfusion over a prolonged period, right? So, so I don't, now again, I've not measured temperature, how quickly the lung rewarms, but I think um, by taking some of the cardiac output away, you probably have some built-in slow rewarming. I agree, and uh, my practice is not to um, try to make the lung too cold as we're implanting, so there might be just sort of a, a cool lap in the back of the lung so that it's not directly against the warm posterior surface, but then as we're sewing, sewing it in, it slowly warms up. And then as Jasleen said, then the controlled reperfusions to try to minimize that, um, that shock between sort of ice temperature and, and, and uh, 38 degrees. So um, I guess uh, next, um, Marcelo, you had mentioned uh, next steps would be a clinical trial and um, where, um, where are you with the planning of that uh, with various centers and is a trial necessary? It seems like it's unanimous in our in our panel today that this is the way to go. Um, what what should be the next steps? And I open this up to everyone. Yeah, no, that that's great. I mean, it's it's important to mention that after the seventy cases uh, that we presented, uh, I think between our three centers, we have done additional hundred cases. You know, and and the experience has been exactly the same. So I, we are very convinced. That that's the way to go. Um, the reason to do a trial for me is more uh, of scientific uh, curiosity and and to try to follow the right steps, you know, of uh, of evidence based approach. Um, and um, but but I again I'm 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 pretty convinced that that's going to be the the gold standard uh, of uh, static preservation. Um, I think that the, the trial that we're thinking about is a randomized trial that is going to evaluate for known inferiority of having a prolonged preservation at 10 degrees. Um, and again, when we say prolonged preservation, uh, this, the timeline we established was uh, 12 hours from cross clamp in the donor to have your patient on the table, okay? So you have that amount of time based on what you need either for logistics or because you want to push to the morning, uh, the transplant. That translates into about a maximum cold ischemic time around, you know, 18 hours. 
Um, and, and then the control group will be the gold standard ice preservation that you normally would try to transplant within, you know, the six to eight hours cold ischemia time. Um, and try to show non-inferiority. As I mentioned in this study that we did that was non-randomized, we already saw some indication of potential benefit in PGD rates, but, but again, uh, the study was not designed uh, for, for that purpose. I would say, Marcelo, I think I agree with you that I think um, it would be best to do a randomized study. And also not only for that purpose, for the randomization, but also because practices for organ recovery are different and how you handle the organ on the back table is different, right? So to have more of a, you know, generalizability of this 10 degree to all these different approaches, I think would be important to also take into account. Yeah, very, very important comment. and, and uh... I think also how you preserve the lung from the beginning, it, right. it's very important and maybe even more important for 10 degrees, um, you know, in terms of, you know, degree of, you know, make sure your lung is properly inflated and, and so on and so forth. Um, I think um, an, another question here, um, which may be more of a ethical question that we always throw in. So. Um, it seems that we have pretty good convincing data that um, this is the way to go, but how do you determine whether or not you need to consent your patients uh, for this? Um, is it still considered experimental now? Is it a difference between simply um, altering the normal temperature, temperature that we use from ice to sort of four to 10 degrees, or do we only need to consent if we're doing time shifting? So what are, what's the panel's thoughts? Well, my, my thoughts are as, as long as we don't have the randomized prospective trial, um, it's, it's very hard to just state that this is the new standard of care. Um, I mean, I, I also disagree that just registry studies as you know, done by, by one company is, is good enough data to just say this is the new standard of care. You should really do your homework in a good way and set up a randomized controlled trial, which can be easily done with the data we have so far, and then really prove that 10 degree prolonged storage is superior to four degree. And uh, then you can change your practice. Before that, I, I think uh, you still need uh, an ethics approval and you need to consent your patients uh, oh. if you expose their donor uh, lungs to a prolonged uh, cold ischemic time. And that's how we do it in Vienna at the moment still. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I think it's important to have a randomized controlled trial to basically establish this as a as a new standard of care. And when I think of consenting patients, I mean, I think there's two reasons to consent to patients for something like this. One is, you know, obviously to collect the data um, and, and publish it. Um, and the second is, um, I think it's important for patients to know that, you know, they may be subjected, their donor lungs may be subjected to a prolonged ischemic time, but at the same time, I don't know that it would be a difficult sell for many patients, because if they really knew what normally happens in terms of how we do these operations in the middle of the night when no one is fresh or under duress, I, I think they would easily buy into the idea that an elective operation of this magnitude uh, has some definite benefits. Yeah, I, 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 do, mean, I, I do agree with uh, Conrad uh, as long as we don't have the randomized clinical trial, we, we just need to consent the patients. Actually, as you said, Michael, uh, Michael, at the beginning, it was a kind of difficult to approach the patients and uh, tell them that we are going to intentionally prolong the ischemic time for, for the lung. And, um, you know, as long as we have done several cases, we have, we've done 21 so far it's really easy to you know, tell the story to the patient and the, the, the patient just to understand the situation. And I think, I think uh, the randomized control trial would be the answer for you know, just the start for the clinical, uh, the ch changing the, the, the practice. So, but before that, I agree with Conrad, we will need the, the consent and also of course, for the collection of data. Errol, I think you were absolutely correct in asking that question because I've been struggling myself with this and how to approach the patients. And it's very good to hear that everybody is on board with the randomized study. 
Yeah, Is just, just want to mention uh, that, I mean, in our experience approaching the patients, we have zero patients declining the study. They were all very comprehensive of that, and they understand, the, the, as Mike said, about doing the transplants in the morning and having a better preservation. And again, I, I want to reinforce that I, I, I agree we need to do this randomized trial, but I also want to mention that people are starting to use this as routine, routine practice. And I have invited people to participate in this trial who told me if the lungs are going to be randomized, I don't want to participate because I don't want to have a chance to go on the ice cooler group and have to do the transplant at three o'clock in the morning because they are no longer doing that you know, as a routine practice. I can tell you like, like large US centers have told me that. So, you know, I think it's still about... important to do, but but we should keep that in mind that the practice is changing regardless of our upcoming try or not. That's totally, uh, thanks for that comment, Marcel. It totally blows my mind. I was just about to say, I think, you know, we have so few randomized controlled trials in lung transplant that I thought this would be one that would be very easy to get everyone on board and, and pull off, but... Now, maybe we've gone too far that no one wants to, to operate at night. I think we've always not wanted to operate at night, but this uh, this is uh, more impetus and support to uh, do it. So. Marcelo, I'll sign up. <laughs> I, I will, we will all sign up. Um, well, uh, thank you to the panelists. I don't know if anyone else had any, uh, any uh, last lingering questions, um, but it's been a great uh, talk and uh, conversation, I think. I do have one question. Um, so for the EVLP, right? I mean, in my mind, EVLP still has place in, in lung transplantation. Like, like everybody here in this panel, you know, we've gone out for um, organs that are on the East Coast that are close to 70 years old that everybody turned down, you know, and we had somebody highly sensitized, blah, 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 right? So, so we brought those organs on EVLP. Is there an age cutoff? Do we have such a thing? Uh, in your trials uh, that uh, the group, uh, three, three centers, what was the upper age limit for your donors? 70. Yeah. 70, okay. Conrad and Jose? Yeah, well, we have done several cases. Sorry, Conrad. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, we have done several cases, cases uh, with donor age uh, above 70 of the trial. And uh, as I said, we've done 21 right now. And we have patients with uh, 75, 76. We just don't, you know, take into account the donor age anymore for 10 degrees preservation. And I do think it's the general practice, right? Yeah, I don't, I mean, as long as, as the, as long as the lung function is good of the donor, age is just a number. Um, I remember an 80 year old donor I did three or four weeks ago, and I was a bit concerned, but uh, the donor was actually quite fit. He was cycling and uh, he had a trauma falling off the cycle bicycle. So, I mean, the lungs had a very good quality. I think you just need to go there, judge on the lung. If the quality is fine, take it. If not, bad luck. But I don't think there is an, 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 a, like a solid age cutoff in nowadays any longer. For this co um, prolonged preservation, I think. Yeah, same. Yeah. Just for transplantation okay. in general. Okay, thanks. Well, I think that's a great, um, a great uh, place for us to end our conversation today. I think uh, we're all very excited about the potential of um, making this or confirming that this is the new uh, standard of care and uh, look forward to uh, seeing everyone during the daylight hours um, as we continue lung transplantation. I'd like to ask the, uh, the audience to, uh, to stay on there. A few announcements from uh, the STS, but thank everyone for participating, our panelists and the audience members for a great webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Sincere thanks to our panelists for your participation and insight. Register today for the STS 59th annual meeting and plan to reconnect with your colleagues in San Diego. STS members receive a registration discount. Learn more and register at sts.org slash annual meeting. 
Join us for the next STS webinar on Thursday, November 3rd, as an expert panel discusses patient selection and technical considerations for two recently FDA-approved technologies for treating aortic disease. Dese details coming soon on STS.org. Thank you and good night. <laughs>